Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Come Off Conqueror Show. Thank you so much for being here today. And I am thrilled to introduce my new guest. He is the husband of a past guest, Nicole. For those of you who haven't seen Nicole's amazing story and her awesome interview, I'll link to it below. Nicole shared about her struggles with pornography and overcoming um, her temptations and how she left her faith, her LDS faith, and came back. And she met her now husband through all of that and how together they have been able to um, really conquer these temptations. They have an awesome marriage. So don't miss her story. But now we get to hear her husband's story and his conversion and how he went from being anti-Mormon to joining the LDS faith. And how that journey has helped heal a lot of his childhood trauma. How he put it just a moment ago was how he healed from his trauma was through relationships his relationship with his now amazing wife, his relationship with the missionaries, his relationship with the church, but really ultimately his relationship with Heavenly Father and how really coming to understand who he is and who the Trinity is, Jesus, and who our Savior is and his role and how there's also a Heavenly Father and how we were put on this earth and we lived in heaven with heavenly parents before we came here, this whole pre-existent story really spoke to him personally and helped put things into perspective and heal the broken heart. And I am thrilled that you get to hear this whole story and how it unravels today. So thank you so much, Cameron, for being here. And just like your cute wife being vulnerable and willing to share. So Cameron, you said that you're, you have a pretty toxic family and clearly you're not like on great terms. I mean, it sounds like it's maybe getting better, but how did that play into, I mean, there's so much we could go here. Like, let's start with maybe some early life stuff, but I really want to focus on your conversion story and how, um, coming to know God has helped you with, um, these challenges with your family. And then obviously with some of these temptations. Okay. So, um, so I'll give a little, uh, pre understanding. So I grew up Baptist. I've always been around, um, different denominations. I've always been spiritual. I've always had um, quite an easy time, so to speak, uh, putting my shoes in under people's uh, shoes as well. Um, I have a friend who converted to Muslim, uh, who's a Muslim now. Um, he used to be Je- uh, Jehovah Witness. Mm. Um, that's he went a from story. a J-Dub to Islam. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, there's reasons why. Um but uh, I've been a lot of places. I've stepped into a lot of places because I got to a point in my life after I moved out um, at an early age of 17 um, that I was searching. I just gave up on the church <clears throat> because um, it, ju- it just wasn't a healthy place for me. I had a lot of issues uh, with the church. And I was the Baptist so- church you were attending? Okay. Yeah. So not only just the church that I attended to, but just the Baptist community, oh. um, how they handle things, how they talked about things, how I'm very much a person who uh, is constantly seeking. I'm constantly hungry. I like to sit out down um, and have a spiritual buffet, so to speak, every single time that um, I do my stuff. I'm not one who just sips. I need to eat. Mm -hmm. and feel full and then go about my day and exercise all that energy and all that protein so to speak that I just consumed into the world and then do it again 
but uh in 20 um 2018 um that's when me and Cole have been dating for quite a while um and then we talked about the music thing um and then towards the end of 2018 she started taking uh her missionary lessons to get back into the church and just like I always do I always support everything that she does uh, if it's a good idea, a bad idea, like I feel like everybody has to do something to learn something. So she wanted to go through that. And I was like, yeah, I'll be there for you. Uh, she told the missionary straight up, uh, do not preach to him. He is anti-Mormon. Um, he's just here to support me. And they were like, I guess they didn't hear that part because majority of the lessons were directed towards me. Um and my conversion story, I remember the one of the first lessons I had um, was um, life is like the game of football. Um, I forget who s- talks about it, um, but he goes in depth about the preexistence. And that's huge for me because that tells me that I am bigger than just, oh, he thought about me in my mother's womb and... Um, and then he, I was born into the world and so on and so forth. This is, I walked with Jesus. I walked with my heavenly father. I was part of a council, a family, and we were all there, uh, talking about basically what any family should be doing. Like, Hey, what are the next steps for the family and what we need to do? Um, so it gives a bigger purpose to who I was and that hit heavy because I also, and very mu- was very much into sports not so much anymore yes. oh, hang on I have to back you up <laughs> you are at this stage I'm so sorry I'm coming down with like some cold or something um so at this stage it's tis the season right um at this stage you and Nicole had been together for a little while you had mm-hmm. um Since started getting into your your um music stuff um which depending on how we edit this, we may have to put in there somehow. Um, but um, you were still anti-Mormon yet. How did you and Nicole, like, how did you reconcile that? You just decided like, she's more than her religion. Like, I mean, I know she was, wasn't like active at that time and stuff, but how did she want to come back to the church? And then how did you were being anti-Mormon? How were you okay with that? like so does that um, make sense what I'm asking yeah I, I'm I'm see if I can unpack that in a way that makes sense um so that's one of the issues I had as being a Baptist is a lot of Baptists are negative towards other denominations uh other Not walks just the of Mormon. faith yeah other walks of faith I mean the church I won't mention who they are just out of respect um, they used to have anti-Mormon days. And when I told my wife that she thought that was insane. And I was like, no, nope, it was common. It was like Saturday or Sunday night. You know, you had an ex-Mormon member come in and say, you know, Jesus or God came down and slept with Mary and said all these things. Yeah. See you, your face. <laughs> and you're like, they said some crazy stuff. And it's like, what? that's, that's indoctrination <laughs> of like, just to hate that kind of type of people. Like, and I got I got to the point where after I stepped out of the church, I'm like, if like, even though I'm not going to church, how is that Christ like? How is that showing love to his children? If we're just like, hey, you don't believe the exact same thing as me. Uh, don't talk to me. You're disgusting. Blah, 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 blah. And I've Preach. never been. I agree. hundred percent. Oh, my gosh. I've never been that way with my wife. I just told her like. Hey, I just don't believe what you believe. And we had many conversations, late conversations. Um, We had many uh, missionary couples come through. I think she went through eight before uh, the final ones that, you know, helped me get baptized. Um, And I would challenge them and uh, she would challenge me and hit me with real questions. And the things of like certain questions uh, would affect me that, you know, these 18 year olds can answer it, but a pastor who has gone to uh, a Christian school, has a doctrine, um, has been doing it for eight years in school, 
and then gets his doctorate and then becomes a bishop or a pastor, so on and so forth, can't answer what are we going to do after we die? And he said, we're going to praise God. And my ADD brain says, no offense, that's lame. I don't want to be doing the exact same thing every single day. <laughs> I love you. Oh, I can see why Nicole likes you. Um, <laughs> so, so, and I get that. Like, what were the other questions? Like, and I hundred percent agree. I have a lot of friends who have different denominations who aren't christian they're jewish they're muslim they're i've got a buddhist friend i have a friend who's a witch um her words not mine i don't remember what she calls it now but um she straight up practices witchcraft but um we can still love each other and see the beauty in each other and in our find the common ground and stuff like that and we can get along beautifully and talk about our differences in such a nice way and not have to fight about it and not be rude and then there's other people I meet who for whatever reason are just so mean and I'm like wow and you call yourself a Christian do you really think this is how Christ would would treat me right now like okay like fine it's your it's your life. It's how you want to do it. But like, I just think it's so interesting. And anyway, what were the questions that, um, I'm curious what some of the questions were that you, um, that she would challenge you on, or that you would challenge the the missionaries on that you, that were profound for you, that helped you, uh, I guess, build, start building a testimony and see things a little bit differently. So, uh, bigger question, the Trinity, that's always been, uh, an issue for her. She's like, it doesn't make sense. And then when she's like, I remember the exact day and like where we were and she was like, can you just explain it to me? And I couldn't. And that's the problem as there was no clear cut. Hey, this is how it is. And I had questions. I would ask like, how does the Trinity work if Jesus was in Gethsemane why was he talking to himself (laughs) like have you read the Nicene Creed no I have not one of these days pull it up and read it it is super confusing at least in my mind it's confusing I I took a Christian history class and a world religion class a bunch of religion classes in college (laughs) and I remember studying the Nicene Creed and reading it and having the professor attempt to explain and me sitting there going what <laughs> like he is but isn't isn't it like there's just so much contradiction in it so it's it I don't blame you I think a lot of people have questions about the trinity and how that works yeah and like I just had questions like why is everything so difficult to explain like our heavenly father is supposed to be a simple being right he had a simple mission it's not a very difficult mission you know, he was the lamb to be slain. So we have a way back to Heavenly Father. So why is all the other doctrine uh, that surrounds this man very complicated? Doesn't make any sense. Um, <clears throat> so I like I would ask about the Trinity as well. Um, I asked about our purpose, what happens after we die, if we are eternal beings and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't understand why uh, you got two Christians get married and they say till death do us part. So it's just like, what's the point of getting married then? If that's not your internal uh, partner or anything like that, it it just doesn't make sense to me because I'm like, okay, so I marry you for, you know, 60 years on this world. We have a great time and then we die. And then I see you in the spirit world. I'm like, hey, we had a good time. You know, I'm with, you know, <laughs> Ashley now. <laughs> and my wife would be like, she's like, I have, you know, all the answers to that if you would just let me show you. And I'm like, no, I don't believe what you believe. So it was very much like a pushback from her. And I just think that's just how I was raised, how I was indoctrined, how all that negativity was pushed on me. And I think it took until 2018. And I think that was 2018, that year alone was when I put a lot of walls down and I was just like okay let's step into this and see what can come of it and I didn't tell her anything 
I don't know if she's told you the story. No, or not. she told me she had, she didn't know you were studying the gospel until you decided to get baptized, right? Like I think I remember her saying that it it was came as a big surprise to her that you were like in. Yeah. So, as the missionaries taught us, I think one of the first lessons I think one of the first lessons was uh, the preexistence that hit heavy for me because. <clears throat> As somebody who grew up not having a purpose, feeling that like he doesn't have a purpose, that basically stated, I have a purpose. I was somebody. I look at people uh, nowadays and like I'll see them talk or whatever. And Cole has gotten used to me saying this. And I'm like, I wonder how they were as they were in the preexistent, what kind of person they were. And like, that's how I think about myself. Like I, I long to know what I was, how loud and bolsterous and just ridiculous I was, you know, when I knew the full gospel, no blockage, no nothing to the point I am at right now, relearning everything and so on (laughs) and so forth. Um, And then I know we had a conversation about the different levels of heaven uh, and that in hell and so on and so forth. And that was hard to digest Mm -hmm. coming from, the Baptist faith. And I was like, I don't know if there's Baptist people who are going to be watching this or not, but it's very clean cut. You tell people uh, either you believe or you don't, you go to hell. And then I always struggle with that because I'm just like, so you got, you got holiday Christians, you got seasonal Christians, you got Christians. uh, I popped in, you know, every 10 years on the death of my blah, 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 Christians and I'm just like, how does that work uh, when, and they just tell, you know, LDS people, you know, uh, faith and works are not going to get you to heaven. And it's very clear in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, faith without works is dead. So it's like, if we're not exercising our religion, living Christ-like, doing servant work, what hence why I do not shy away from anybody asking me to do anything. Um, how is that living the Christ like? How is just me raising, you know, the pastor is playing beautiful music and he's like, You want to give your life to God? I say the same prayer as him. I walk up to the altar. He's like, Hey, brother, thank you for choosing today. We're going to give you some literature. Slaps me on the butt and says, You're now a Christian. And he's like, That's all you need. And all I have to do is rely on the faith of my pastor and, you know, I'm going to heaven. But if other people don't believe, you know, that and get, they don't even take baptism very serious. Um, some people get baptized and some people don't. And that was a huge thing uh, that the LDS faith planted in me is like, no, this is a staple of our faith. This is a cleansing of all our sins previously and making a new covenant with our Heavenly Father that we are going forth. And every time we take uh, sacrament, it is us now washing away the sins of that week. And I needed that because that wasn't a common thing in the Baptist. We had we had communion um, once a month. Uh, and it was just like, you know, they pass it around with the table. So you put money in, you take your bread and you drink it. You know, if you go to certain places, they give you actual wine and people are all sharing wine. And I'm just like, this is weird. And I was just like, we're not taking it super seriously. If this is one of the major covenants that we're making, why aren't we taking it seriously? So um, those were some huge questions that I had and they touched on. And then that's when I started to pray after our sessions and be like, Heavenly Father, if this is true, show me in the best way that I would understand and he would do that. He would show it <clears throat> in uh, literature. He showed it through YouTube videos. Um, he did all that. Like uh, Cole told me, you know, she's like, could it not be possible that, you know, Heavenly Father visited the ancient Americas? And at that time, I was like, yeah, it could be possible, but we don't know. And then I read a full article and it was a hefty one about the Hopi Nation and it was literally, and I was like, hey, Cole, look at this. And she was like, see, I told you. And then the next week it was 
you know, about the different sections of, you know, heaven and hell and everything. And I w woke up that morning, I walked in to my YouTube account. And the first video was a guy talking about uh, Judgment Day. And everybody had these uh, clear bodies and they had seeds in their body uh, bodies. And everybody had different amounts of seeds and everything like that. And he was like, he was in a big line and uh, he could hear a thundering voice, you know, depart from me. And then a section would open up and it'd be this great heat and the people would get sucked in and then there would be a delayed scream and then they would disappear. And he's like, this was happening quite frequently. And he's like, I'm getting closer and closer. And he's like, I stand before God and he starts talking to me. He starts replaying my life and saying, hey, he, these are the good things that you did. And then he starts talking about the seeds of my chest. And he's like, why do you still carry the seeds that I told you to lay at my feet? And he's like, what do you mean? So he plays all the anger, all the hate, all these things that he held against other people. And those are the seeds that he kept in his heart and he didn't give to God. And he is like, uh, he's like, at this point now, I can't even look at him. He's like, I feel guilty. I'm not worthy. I'm just looking down. <clears throat> he's like, my heavenly father uh, finishes. And he says, because of these things, you could have done better. But because I love you, I have made a place, a section of heaven specifically for you. And that struck a chord with me. And then he said, a section opened up. And it was stairways. And he said, as I started to walk up into those stairways through that doorway, he's like, my body started to transfigure into a spiritual being. And then I woke up. And wow. that struck a huge accord with me uh, in regards. And then the next week after that, so that's three weeks. And the missionaries come back. And we're talking. We're sitting on the thing. And Elder Larson, who is still my buddy to this day, he looks over and he goes, he starts flicking his pen. He goes, I think I need to pencil you in for a baptism. What do you say? And I said, let's do it. And Cole literally like turns and goes like, who is this? What is going on? <laughs> and that's, that's basically how my conversion worked is basically I literally had to let down my walls, stop being so angry towards uh, a set of people that I did not understand or give myself to um, a chance to put my feet into their shoes. And when I did, a lot of my answers or my questions were answered through 18 year olds. And uh, after that, like after my baptism and everything like that, um, a lot of people were like, hey, you need to read the Book of Mormon, read the Book of Mormon, read it. You haven't even read the Book of Mormon yet? No, I've I've read it. I haven't no, read it straight did, through. Okay, so you had been reading it, just not like straight through until like after your baptism. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't start there. I started in the Pearl of Great Price. Okay. And everybody's like, "That's weird. Why would you start there?" Um, the and I love I love the Pearl of Great <laughs> Price because especially when it talks about, um, you know, Moses. Was it Moses? Yeah, Moses and uh, his vision and him seeing God and that whole trial. I was like, I was like, no wonder, like he acted the way he did in the Bible. I was like, no wonder he was stepping up into Pharaoh's thing. Like, I got this, bro. Like, and Pharaoh's like, I'm gonna do this to you. And he's like, try me, bro. I got, <laughs> I know you can't see him, but he's with me. <laughs> And like that stuck out to me because like that is the mentality that we should have as Christians is we should be able to walk into the palace of the evil one and just be like, hey, bro, we strapped uh, like we got an angel. We got an army of angels. You can't do nothing to me. Uh, I have the power to put my foot on your neck. And a lot of Christians give the devil way too much power and give God way too little power. And that's my mentality is, and that's why I think that's why Heavenly Father pointed me that direction first, because that would stick out to me more than the Book of Mormon. 
I have read the Book of Mormon. It's beautiful. <laughs> but the Pearl of Great Price I hold just slightly above the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I love it. I just think it's so, I think it's cool that you were baptized without reading really reading the book of mormon because so many people i've heard where it's like they had to read that first and really receive a confirmation that that was true before they they could get baptized but the things that spoke to you i mean it makes sense because of the questions you had and so what spoke to you or the things that were going to answer those questions i mean heavenly father clearly knows you very well and very intimately to be able to give you those things that you need. And I think that's a good testament of what he does for all of us, right? Like the scriptures that stand out to me are going to be different than you or Nicole or anyone else. Right. And my husband and I can listen to the same. We, for scripture study at night, um, we listen to <coughs> conference talks or, or, or uh, the gospel library app, something in there. It's usually has to do with whatever we're studying at the time. Right now I'm working on a, a book for women about their purpose on and what, how to find their divine purpose. So a lot of our talks right now are centered around that, that we're reading. And it's interesting because we'll read the exact same thing or study the exact same thing and we'll get two completely different things out of it because it's our perspective. It's where we're coming from it, right? Where we're coming at it from his experiences and the questions on his mind and the struggles that he's dealing with are different than mine. So we have a different lens that we're reading it through. So when you, um, after you joined the church, did you tell your family that you were getting baptized or did you wait to tell them? Like, how did that all go down? Um, so I started dating Nicole. They found out, uh, Nicole was LDS. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, they already had their <clears throat> viewpoint of them, um, of her, um, and it was negative. Um, I continued to date her. Um, they were like, she just got out of marriage. Uh, she doesn't know what she wants. Why are you taking on that burden? Um, she's LDS. She doesn't believe what you believe. Um, so on and so forth. We had that conversation. And I was just like, I was like, why can't we heal together? Like, why does it have to be like, I wait until she gets good. It's like, I'm broken as well. Like, why can't she help me and I help her? And they couldn't answer that. And I was like, fine, whatever. And then we continued to date and so on and so forth. And, you know, we had, I would say, a mediocre at best relationship with them like Cole went on vacations with her them and stuff like that but she never really felt part of the family I've never felt part of the family that's like a my childhood and all that that's another story that's a long story um I guess we'll have to do like a part two or something like that or just <laughs> hey I want to know your story and I'll talk to you later kind of thing but uh so as that progressed, their viewpoint of the of her got more toxic. I remember um, we had a dog. His name was Yoshi. And it was the same time when we were living in that small uh, garage apartment. And I'm like, he can't stay here. I was like, he is a shepherd dog. He needs to run. He needs space. Um, he's just uh, bound to get out and get into trouble. And he's just destroying the house and everything. And I was like... I'm going to hit up my mom and see, you know, if she'll take it because they live up in Williams and they have a decent amount of property. And even though it's not closed in, she can strap them to like a 50 yard uh, chain and he can just run it off. And so I hit her up and they're like, yeah, bring him down. So Cole was at work and I went down and uh, I don't know why, but today they decided to go off on Nicole and uh, I said some very choice words, not very nice words. I told them to shut the bleep up. And I was like, you've never sat down and talked to her or her family. You have never made an effort. Uh, I, I was like, I find it disgusting that you call yourselves Christians, but yet you don't give people uh, the benefit of a doubt. And it's just like, don't contact me or don't contact her about it. 
And this has been an ongoing thing throughout my relationship with her, with my parents specifically. And I remember coming back home and that like really affected me. And I was like pissed off and all that stuff. I guess Cole had a bad day at work and she came home and I guess she was unloading on me because she was like, you never there for me. You never defend me and so on, so on, so forth. And I just lost my control. And I was just like, this is what I do behind closed doors. This is what I've been doing behind closed doors for a long time. I just never told you because I didn't think you could handle it. And that changed right there for her. She was like, oh, he does do stuff. <clears throat> He's just been protecting me the way he thinks that I wanted to be protected. Uh, after that, um, I proposed to her in Hawaii. And and then we came, when we came back, um, we kind of, even though I wasn't LDS, we kind of did the LDS thing and got married within three months. And I was just like, some, something told me, I was like, my gut is my spirit. It's always been and how it always has been. And my gut was telling me strongly, like, you guys need to elope before the ring ceremony. Told Cole, she was like, that's fine. So we went down to Sedona. We got our closest friends and family, basically her family. And we eloped. And a month later or so, we ended up having a lunch with my father. And this lunch was supposed to be with my mother, my father, and like the whole family telling everybody like, hey, we're getting married and so on and so forth. Um, and he came by himself. Uh, to his degree, he came strapped with the Heavenly Father, but he came strapped with contention, anger, and hate. And he said some of the nastiest things to my wife in that lunch uh, to the point where I had to slide in because at first I was just playing off like, hey, this is my fiance, blah, blah, blah. And after she started crying, that's when I slid in. I'm like, You're, you cannot talk to my wife like that. I find it extremely disrespectful that you are talking to her like that. So now that he's not winning her over, he's now directing his hate towards me. And I remember it getting so negative to the point where I just said, you know, um, what do you think I am mentally? And he's like, mentally or physically? And I was just, I checked out at that point. I was just like, wow, so you think I'm a moron? You think I'm an idiot? So on and so forth. Um, so I got up and I pretty much started walking out without my wife. She like quickly was like, thank you for lunch. And we hopped in the Jeep and we were driving back from Flag to Cottonwood. And I remember crying and just punching the wheel steering wheel and just yelling out loud like why is there so much hate towards me and my wife why are these people the way they are and so on and so forth and I had a moment when I got home I took a shower I was eating chicken in the shower and now that's kind of funny but I was going through it and uh I guess my mom took it upon herself to send uh, me a nasty email and she basically stated uh, I've always been a toxic person I've always been an evil person and I am disowned from the family and I gave it to Cole and she read it and then she responded back and they act like to this day that that never happened so it's always been toxic with them it's never been uh, a healthy relationship uh, I didn't grow up in a family where my mom and dad said, good night, I love you. Uh, the only time I heard I love you from my father was after he beat me. <clears throat> and he would state it the way of, you know why I beat you? And I'd be like, no. And he was like, because I love you. And that's the only time I would hear that phrase. Um, we did not hug as a family. Um, the hugging didn't start until I started dating Nicole. And she even stated, she's like, when I first started dating you, your hugs were freaking weird. Uh, she's like, you didn't know how to hug. <laughs> and now I hug everyone. Like, I'm more, like, people are more concerned about, and I'm like, no, come, bring it in. I was like, you need six daily hugs. I'm going to be one of them. <laughs> so um, a lot of people don't understand, like, she has 
been a lot of my healing process in the fact of she's been the first person that I have been able to share my trauma with and all the dark stuff. She has actually been the first person to actually witness the toxic side of my parents and they have not held that back from her. They have showed her everything. So after she saw that and had heard of my story, she was like, I now get it. You are not crazy. They make you seem crazy. And you were just a kid, but they still hold those things against you. Um, and so that's that whole part of um, that section of, you know, the toxicness of my family and everything. Um, so we ended up uh, not talking to them. I sent them a message saying to my parents alone, not the rest of the family, just my parents. I come like from a family of 10. Um, yeah, and I'm the oldest of eight and six of those uh, kiddos are adopted. Um, and I told my mom and dad, you were uninvited from the wedding. Everybody else is still allowed. Um, the only person to show up that day from my family was my sister, my adopted sister, uh, Cassie. Everybody else didn't show up. Uh, my grandma lied to me. She told me she wasn't going to be in town. She was in town. Um, she was just kicking it up in uh, Williams instead of coming down to flag to the reception and everything. Um, there's a song by Andy Minio and it's called Family Photo. Um, and he talks about in that song where in his, he had, he has issues with his father and like the whole time, even though it's his special day, he's still hoping his father shows up. And that's how I was that day. I remember giving a talk towards after we uh, said our vows and everything. And I just turned to Cole's family. I'm like, you guys don't understand like how much it means to me that you guys are my family. And I broke down and started choking up. And it's just like, I was like, my family can't even make it to here to my, the biggest day of my life. They can't even push their negativity about what they think they know about someone in a church aside for literally an hour, an hour or two um, to just watch a quick ceremony and eat some food and then go home. So that's hurtful. So you were, let's talk about what's helped you. I mean, I know you just said Nicole has been a big part of your healing process and obviously the church um, has been there for you too. Is there anything, um, you mentioned music, how has, uh, doing the spoken word, your poetry, um, stuff helped? Is it, um, and is there anything else that has been helpful for you on your journey? Um, I would say, uh, becoming an artist has helped, um, because, it kind of like takes, instead of keeping everything behind closed doors, I shine a light towards it. And me and Cole have the same mentality about this. Um, we share our all our faults. When I was teaching uh, adults Sunday school, I told them straight up, like, I struggle with porn. And they were all shocked. And they were like, thank you for your vulnerability. And I'm like, I was like, you can't use it against me if it's out in the open. Yeah. And that that's how I treat the enemy is like, you can't use it against me if I'm telling people about it. Um, so that's what my music is, is where I go to be vulnerable, where I go to be, uh, you know, clean, clear cut about like the things that I struggle with. Um, so that has helped. Uh, my wife and me don't have, I guess, what other people considered like a normal relationship I was like I consider it normal but we have a very open uh relationship we have conversations we're on the same page 24 7 like if somebody texts me and was like hey your wife did this and I was like I already know she told me 10 minutes ago and they're like oh and I was like that's how knit wired we are like if something happens she knows about it first if I'm struggling with something, she knows about it first. If she's struggling with something, she comes to me and she's like, hey, I've been sh struggling with this, this, and this. And it's like, hey, I'm here for you. I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, I have told her all my deepest, darkest secrets. I have told her all my trauma, all my past. 
And it's the first time I've ever had a woman in my entire life actually sit down, listen, and say, I understand where you are. You are now in a place where you are loved. You don't have to dwell in that place anymore. Um, I So she's been a huge part of it. Uh, the church has been a huge part of it uh, in my healing process. When I got baptized, um, a lot of people from the ward that I was going to be in showed up. Mm -hmm. To this day, that family, those people are still some of the strongest people I got behind me. Like when I tell you I got angels behind me, I'm I'm not joking. I got angels. I got Cottonwood behind me. I now have Prescott Valley behind me. It's just like everywhere I go, we meet people. We make these connections. We add them to our army. We add them to our team. Um, getting emotional that. about it. I love that. <laughs> um, That's how it should be as a Christian family. We should be rallying behind each other like that. And... I love the idea of all of these people becoming your defenders and your, you know, part of your army. And that's what a beautiful um, vision or picture that paints, you know, and seeing all of the people who will be there to defend you and to cheer you on. And, and I'm sure all those people are all those your your ward and stuff like that it's that's beautiful I love that like one of the bigger moments of my walk in this church was when I went for my endowments the first time um I went through my endowments during COVID which to some people would be like oh you know that kind of sucks blah blah so on and so forth now I think Heavenly Father set it up to be that way for a purpose um so I got to pick my people I got to pick uh, I think it was like 16 people. Um, so we all went through. You had um, like your own private session. That is so cool. Oh my goodness. So, That's neat. so I got to have my own people there who, uh, I got to handpick. I was like, Hey, I want you here. I want you here. I want you here for this reason. And I sent them all a message. It wasn't just like, Hey, can you be here? It was like, I have chosen you to be here because you have done this for me. And this is how I value you. And every single person was there. And we went through the temple and everything. I was the last one to go through. And as they parted the veil and I walked in, it was like a coming home moment. So friends and family came up and gave me hugs. And I'm and I'm thinking about it the whole time. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm like, this oh, is what beautiful. it's going to be when it's like heaven. So. I'm going to see my adopt. I'm going to see my birth father. I'm going to see his family. They're going to come up. And it's going to be the first time I see them. I'm just like, this is what it's all about. Um, But that's what I mean is I never had those experience uh, <clears throat> in Baptist faith. I'm not squashing on it. <clears throat> I'm just saying. This has just given me more uh, connection with my Heavenly Father. I have learned way more here than I he did here. I consider that as stepping stone. If I didn't have that foundation, I would not be here. Absolutely. Yeah. It was 2018. Go back. Yeah, so it was 2018. At this point in my life, I wasn't a member. <clears throat> um, and I was just chilling in the corner of our port apartment. And I was just on the computer chilling. And I heard clear as day, like somebody standing right next to me say, buy your microphone, start your music career. And I turned around and it was like this, is like kind of like this setup. I turned around and Cole was in the bed and I was like, did you just say something to me? She's like, no, I'm not talking to you. And I was like, <laughs> I, I literally you. just heard somebody tell me buy a microphone. And she was like, okay, do it. I was like, well, we only have like 150 bucks. And she was like, I trust you. You can make it work. And I've been doing music since 2018. And it's kind of like my therapy. <clears throat> so when I'm my artist, uh, when I'm doing it for myself, it is my therapy. So it's where I go to vent. 
about mm-hmm. all the things and all the issues and the hardships um, instead of paying somebody. Why pay somebody when I can just do it myself and talk it out? So, <laughs> so are you a um, a singer then or are you a musician? Like what do you, when you say your music, what kind of music are you doing? So I do more spoken word. Um, I've gotten into singing a little bit of melodies um, on some of my newer tracks and everything. Um, but I strictly am just a spoken word or- artist, so I do more poetry, um, not so much rap. But it's just like if we're going to have a candid conversation of like, OK, well, you know, talk about your hardship and I'll just tell you how it is. Except it's just going to flow more poetry, more beautifully paint a picture, so to speak, instead of just me just talking. Okay, I need to hear some of this stuff. Um, I haven't known either of you, obviously, for very long. I just met you, yeah. but and I just really met Nicole not too long ago either. But I need to see this. So you have a YouTube channel, then? Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I have. I'm on every major platform, but I can send you something real quick, and that way you can look at it real quick. Music is um, very therapeutic for me as well. I don't create my own stuff. I've only composed, well, I helped compose one song. Um, I wrote a song with a friend um, for a uh, a charity that I was running. And anyway, I wanted, we were writing, I wrote a commercial for it. We were trying to people would always say, we, we need a video. Can you tell us what Community Christmas is all about? So I wrote a commercial and then I just felt like it should be a music video. And so I wrote this song, sent it to my friend who's a composer and said, help me make this into like a, a beautiful song. And he, he took it and created this really pretty song. And then we had this children's choir sing it and Wow. He, um, and then he also sang on it as well. And it was beautiful. But anyway, I love music. It's a big part of my life. So I think that's so cool that that's, and I understand it's very therapeutic. When I was little, I would write my own, I would like sing songs I would make up. And it was, it was very therapeutic. I don't think I could do that now, but so I'm impressed. Very, very impressed. So you yeah, said so my... on chat. Huh? You sent it on chat. I want to. Yeah. Uh, my music career started off. So like just basically me venting everything. Mm-hmm. And it, <clears throat> after I became a member, I was sitting in. Oh, I'm, I'm pausing it. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, I was sitting in service or whatever. Uh-huh. And there's so many talented people at church <clears throat> that don't do anything with their stuff. And I turned to my wife and I was like, I didn't know this person had a voice. And she was like, yeah, they've been singing forever. I was like, I'd like to collab with them. So like the first person I collabed with, her name's Ashley Graham. She's like a mom of four, very talented uh, little lady. And she was like, yeah, I've never had anybody, you know, kick my butt and push me in the direction to do my music and so on and so forth. And we've done a few songs we sent a song in last year it's called fireflies to the church um by spring maybe we might get picked maybe we won't we will see i hope so that'd be so cool so uh anyway the song that i sent you is called haunted and it was me talking about um this december so christmas is one of my favorite holidays but it's also one of the uh, most anxiety and base ones because you think about Christmas, you think about family. I don't have a good relationship with my family. So for the first time uh, after, you know, my parents not showing up to my wedding and all that stuff, they finally reached out and invited me and my wife to Christmas. And this talks about uh, like my initial reaction to everything um so yeah okay i'm gonna listen haunted 
powerful um who's singing um so it's a sample that i found and i edited it but i'm singing on top of her oh cool that's neat that's wow you're like really talented in the writing and obviously in the composition side of things and the editing like that's impressive um wow i i'm hoping to get um start voice lessons back up again i used to do that when i was younger and anyway i love singing i think it's for me it is the quickest way to fill the spirit is through music and absolutely because through my music I've had some open conversations with teenage boys to adults reaching out like hey man like that song that you talked about like I have one where it was <clears throat> I woke up in the middle of the night because uh me and Cole have like the same demons so I struggle with my sexual uh immorality and pornography and I woke up and we were sleeping on the couch after watching a movie or whatever. And I just had the strongest urge. <clears throat> so I wrote about it and he reached, uh, I had a kiddo reach out to me and he's like, bro, he's like, uh, that was deep. And he's like, I needed that. He's like, I have this on repeat because um, this is something I struggle on a daily basis and nobody's talking about it. And like, I talk about topics that, no offense, a lot of the members just don't feel comfortable. Yeah. And I have no problem. <laughs> no offense taken here. Clearly, I'm okay with talking about these things because I had Nicole talk about it twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I agree. I feel like so much of this, like the darkness, it will be dispelled through us sharing and bringing it to light like nicole said in in her interview you know and there's a culture among our church i think it started back i, I can't remember there's a talk i want to say in the 70s um that i listened to a long time ago where he talks about not airing your dirty laundry and i remember listening to that talk and going oh, that is where it comes from Okay, I get it now. I get now why people are so reluctant to share these things. And while I think there's a time and a place that's appropriate, probably over the pulpit during Sunday meeting with all these fragile ears, is not, maybe not the best place to talk about some of these things. But that doesn't mean we can't talk about them at all, right? Absolutely. Like, there's there's so many people who are like Nicole and I talked about secretly suffering who have these demons and they just, they don't know what to do with their urges and they don't know what to do with the temptations that they're facing, whether it's pornography addiction or alcohol or drugs or cutting, you know, self-harm or yep. anorexia or eating disorders. I mean, there's so many things and so many different ways that we can be plagued that, if we don't talk about them, we're going to think we are so broken and so past God's love. And that's just not true. Um, I appreciate you so much willing you so much being willing. I can talk to come on and to share your story and your life. And, um, it's really cool to hear. I love conversion stories. They're some of my favorite to listen to and I hope, um, I hope that things with the family get better. Um, no, nah, I was like, I'm at the point, like I told you in text, I was like, I straight up, uh, so my biggest issue has been, and that was one of the issues that I was like struggling with for quite a while being a member of this church is everybody kept telling me, the, you know, we have 
general conference and they're always saying like, hey, you know, reach out, love your enemies and turn the other cheek and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I'm like, bros, I, I've been doing this since I was 21. Like I've been trying to make amends with my family since I was 21. I'm now turning 33 and nothing has happened. And then finally, I think Heavenly Father was like, hey, I heard what you were needing because this last general conference, they straight up said, you know, you can forgive people, but you don't have to dwell in that toxic space. Yes. And yes. I'm like, thank you. And I, and that Elder like, Holland? I think so. And I remember like when that was said, I was like, yes, finally, like stop yeah. trying to force me to make amends and dwell in the place of people who don't want me there who, people who don't have straight up said i'm not a member of their family people who have straight up said nasty things and don't believe or want to make any amends so it's like you can make to... amends in your heart mm -hmm. and not hold a grudge anymore and you can forgive without like physically being there like they've said repeatedly not just in this last conference but in past conferences too like we don't condone abuse like you don't need to stay in an abusive relationship like forgiveness is for you to let go of your own burdens because holding a grudge is heavy that is so heavy and it's dark so holding on to that darkness only dampens your own soul and only dampens your own ability to feel good. And so forgiveness really is about severing the anchor of the grudge and the anchor of the hurt. And when you cut those chains, that anchor falls to the bottom of the ocean and you get to rise to the top, right? And so many talks in the last few years have been about abuse. It's been awesome for me personally because I run this channel right like everyone I remember when the when the we are we are conquerors talk um by that that guy um I can't think of his name now an amazing talk I remember when that talk came out and I just started this channel I don't even know how many people sent me a text are you listening to conference right now are you listening to conference? They're talking about you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, they're not talking about me, but yes, I know what you're saying. Like, <laughs> it was so funny. And then like three other talks and in, in conference were also about abuse. And I was like, this is awesome because it is a problem worldwide. It doesn't matter what denomination you are in. We have this issue and we need to quit putting our heads in the sand and pretending that it's not there. And Anyway, we could go on forever and ever and ever. So um, we're going to finally cut it. Sorry. No, um, it's okay. But you're awesome. You and Nicole are amazing. There's a video I'm going to send you um, of another conversion story of a guy who also went through an abusive family and his ward family has become his family and he's receiving his endowments. Um in the next, I want to say it's like in a week. And anyway, he's moving here from California and I'm like terrified for him because I'm so, I just hope that his new ward family, wherever he moves, embraces him and loves him like his California family has because they have shown him so much love. And I just keep praying like, please, please put him in a good place please put him in a good place and yeah. he can have the same kind of experience here in you talk but anyway i'm gonna send you his story i think you'll like it cool it's fun and if for for those of you who are watching who um uh haven't seen it i'll link down below for all of you guys too thanks so much for being here cameron and everyone for watching and for joining our show you guys are awesome please like share subscribe, all that stuff. It helps us grow the channel so we can get more of these amazing stories out. So if you have any suggestions or know anybody who you think would be a great interview, I'm always looking for uh, new people to interview, new stories. I have met some of the most incredible people this year that you guys just astound me. You all are so inspiring and just the way you can rise above and just triumph over these trials is just so inspiring. I feel this show has been so healing for me and 
I just hope that it can do that for other people. So thanks everybody until next week. See you later.